you know, getting your butt into the chair and your hands on the keys um, and seeing where it goes. I believe you have to have an outline, um, but then you got to like throw away that outline. Um, it will uh, uh, take paths of the surprises to the uh, the artists that created it. I've never known any buddy who uh, ever wrote anything that wasn't surprised, who wasn't surprised by di lines of dialogue that the characters seem to invent by themselves and twists and turns in the story. Uh, I remember asking Neil Simon, do you laugh at your own jokes? And he said, sure I do the first time I hear them. And I think that's fantastic that he actually hears them. It's as if somebody else is telling them, telling these jokes to him. And that's the experience I think of a lot of artists. Uh, it's not. I, I wrote a Twilight. I sold a, a Twilight Zone episode years and years ago about a, a muse. It's a sort of a, a composer of commercial jingles and his muse uh, that proposes. If I, I'll spare you the story. If I told you the story, you'd think, "Hey, what a good story!" Um, but they, uh, the the thesis underneath it was the notion that muses don't desert their artists. It's really the other way around. You have to be available. Uh, it's never easy to get in into, uh, and you have to own that. You have to know that. Uh, I'm not sure that answers what's the first thing you do. Usually, something occurs to you that seems kind of odd. You know, imagine if this happened or that happened. Remember when my first child was going to be born? Uh, we went to birth classes. You know, birth preparation classes, and, uh, which were held at Cedars um, Sinai. And everybody was supposed to bring a pillow. So suddenly outside, you know, near Beverly uh, uh, Boulevard, near uh, San Vicente, whatever it is, like all of these um, couples, all of the women are quite pregnant, and everybody's carrying pillows. You know, what's that about? Uh, imagine, you know, you're waiting, you drive past a bus stop, and there's like... 60 people at the bus stop and they all have accordions. I don't know, they all got accordions for some reason. What could that be and how could that, you start to think about that. Um, and also you don't think about it, you just sort of like let it simmer and, and cook and maybe a notion will come to you uh, and that you start to play with it uh, and, and, and see how it unfolds. I know there are uh, other people, including people you're talking to, I'm sure, who have much more precise steps. Uh, I reject that in my own work and in the work of the writers that I know. Uh, again, I think uh, that it's a, um, uh, a function of surprise a lot of art is and the the important thing for the artist is to stay open to those surprises rather than try to drag the narrative back to some previous intellectual preconception that you had. The very first script I ever wrote, and I never did sell it, I wrote it in class, like my own class, except it was Crosstown, with Erwin R. Blacker, legendary teacher of screenwriting, now long deceased, but he taught George and Milius and all of these people. Um, and um, uh, I wrote a story based loosely on an experience that I'd had when I'd worked in the project uh, Head Start, the pilot Head Start program, the uh, War on Poverty, a Lyndon Johnson program having to do with uh, support for preschoolers in the schools. And there was one social worker who, um, a white guy, advantaged and privileged guy, but he kind of like would speak with a sort of a fake black accent, a streety kind of black jab, you know, hey bro, what's going on? You know, and he thought that uh, uh, that really impressed the the black kids he was working with, he was not working with little kids in Head Start, he was working with adolescents in another program. Um, and the establishment, the people who ran that program thought, boy, this guy really goes the extra mile. I thought he's an idiot. He's just patronizing and condescending. You know, I'm a Jew. Imagine somebody trying to make points with me by speaking with a Yiddish accent. No, Richard was Wills too. You know, like I would think, whoa, what a, what a cool guy this is, talks the talk. Well, this guy got killed. Uh, he was murdered, and I uh, thought that's something to write a script about. Uh, when I wrote the script, I thought it was the social worker's story, the white kid's story, but when I got done, it was really the black kid's story, and I didn't realize that until I was done with the first draft. 
And the smartest thing I did was to leave it alone uh, in that regard. That is to say, I rewrote it several times, but I let it become the Black Kid's story, which is a much more interesting story. The white guy was a subsidiary character, now not the protagonist of the piece. Um, I never sold that script, but I did get representation. I got top representation. I got assignments. I got on staff at Universal. A lot of uh, writers don't get it that when a script doesn't sell, that's not the end. It's just the beginning. There's all kinds of rewards that can flow from the script that doesn't sell. Also, a script that doesn't sell now might sell, you know, down the line. Clint Eastwood made... Um, Unforgiven, which won the Oscar for Best Screenplay, Best Movie, uh, about 20 years after he acquired that script. Uh, yeah, so so you, you, never, you never really know. But what was the uh, point um, talking about? Oh, uh, again, if, you, if a first draft, you put all the work you put into a first draft and you end up realizing that the guy that you thought was protagonist isn't the protagonist, it's not his story at all, some other... That's not a waste. That's not, that shouldn't be frustrating. That's a really good use of that draft. You'll salvage some of the stuff in the draft, but also you'll have used it to kind of point you in the direction that you need to go. You can't figure it out in advance. You just can't. Kushner at the Lincoln screening, have you seen it? You, you, uh, maybe you won't like it at all, but I think it's impossible not to be astonished by how engaging it is and important it is in the best sense of important. Um, and uh, uh, and it is a stupendous screenplay by Cush. <clears throat> and, and Tony was saying, a lot of people think you think the thing up in your head and then you write it down. But he says the writing down of it is sort of the thinking of it, that there's a nexus between the pen or the keyboard, the hands on the keyboard that kind of create it. And you just never know. And you have to live with that uncertainty. Uh, you have to sort of rejoice and, and, and celebrate and embrace that uncertainty instead of um, trying to eliminate the uncertainty. You look at the, the the studios today are what's less interesting than what they're doing now. They're doing prequels and sequels and items of franchises. What they're trying to do is minimize risk. Um, they're trying to make it so that when an audience goes to see a movie, they get what they expected. But when I go to the movies, I don't want to see what I expected. I want my expectations to be exceeded. I want to be turned upside down. I want to be frightened. I want to. I want my life to be changed forever. It's funny. I I, I um, lectured September a year ago uh, to a an evangelical Christian conference in Chicago. Five hundred pastors from all across the nation <clears throat> on narrative in Scripture. I was never more warmly greeted or uh, generously received. They also paid me very well. Uh, but I never had a better time, you know, I mean, I've given hundreds of of speeches uh, all around the world. I never had a better time than I did in Chicago with all these sweet Christians. And uh, one of the things I told them was, if you want to keep people in the church, even after they leave the church on Sunday morning, uh, that is to say they should think about the sermon, if you want them, just like if they leave your movie, thinking about it, I'm still thinking about Lincoln, I saw it over a week ago, and it's still playing in my head. Um, and the more time that passes, the more I'm into it, not less. It's not fading, it's getting stronger. I'll probably see it again. Um, the, uh, oh, what is the point? The, um, uh, uh, oh, the, yeah, the, the Christians. Um, if you want people to see in the movie, uh, just like if you want them to stay in the church, what I told them was, you don't need to make people feel good, you just have to make them feel. Scare them half to death. Make them cry, you know. Imagine, I remember walking out of a theater in Westwood and the doors, I, I was walking down the street past the theater and the doors opened and people started to stream out. It had just broken. And I saw somebody I knew, but there were a lot of people between us. And I sort of indicated, you know, we waved, hey, hi, you know, and then uh, I pointed to the marquee and shrugged, meaning, so what do you think? By this time, he was able to get up to me, and he said, oh, um, it's a, a good, it's a worthy movie that I certainly think you should see. And I said, um, you know, what I said earlier, like, uh, 
Uh, I, you know, this doesn't make me very popular with people when I tell them what they thought of a movie. Or they tell me what they thought of a movie and I tell them, no, that's not what you thought. What you thought was such and such. Uh, I understand that that's pretty arrogant. Um, but what can I tell you? I'm just reporting honestly on what I, on my own reaction. And I said to this guy, you won't be surprised. You know, I said, you know what? I hear you saying it's a worthy movie, but it seems like my impression is you didn't like this movie. Now I want you to imagine instead of the uh, the, the picture breaking and people streaming on the street, but they're all crying. Everyone in them is sobbing with str tears streaming down their faces. Um, well, you wouldn't want to see that movie, would you? The hell you wouldn't. You'd immediately go to see that movie. You'd stop. You'd stand up your date, your next appointment, and you'd get in line to see that movie if it could affect people so uh, so strongly.